Okay. So yeah, let, let's just take some time. I think it was there was a feedback last on Monday, which I think is good to have a secondary QA on the project, on the challenge and understanding after people are able also to see and read. I think that was, um, the, so anyone has question about the challenge itself and anything related to clarifications, questions that are not being covered. I think there will be some tutorials that are covering, but. Yeah, not Nail, not Nail Melissa. Uh, <clears throat> my question is, uh, is it like using a bucket uh, fully restrictive? I mean, like, we, can we use like uh, serverless like Next.js? I think this question has been raised, but I didn't get like a brief explanation on that. No. Uh, what do you think, Edidia? Uh, yes, I think th that's possible. It's possible to use other, uh, you can use the serverless like Next.js or any other, uh, uh, yes, in any other frameworks to build the backing, the backing for the smart contract implementation as an alternative of the smart contract implementation. Uh, what do you mean by the alternative of uh, smart contract? Uh, okay, so the, uh, what we have is one of the uh, way that we can implement this week's project is to just call the APIs provided by Algorand, right? Yes. Uh, to do that, uh, one thing you can do is you just can use the SDKs, the Python SDK, the JavaScript SDK, or the SDK, the SDK in any other programming language, and just serve your button using the SDKs and on the front end, you'll be just calling those uh, endpoints from the back end and serving it uh, to the user. And as an alternative, uh, it would be based if you can, uh, if you have time and uh, work on the smart contract implementation, but if not, uh, you should at least implement, you should fully implement the back end implementation using the API calls uh, from the algorithms SDK implementation. So I, th I think, you know, the, the point is there are, I mean, I, I, the one part is basically just uh, interacting with the blockchain, right? In this case, the Algorand blockchain and they are, ex so they have their own APIs that you need to call. And you could basically they have SDKs for JavaScript and you could use that one. And then there's another part, if you want to, of course, depending on your implementation, you may have also just a web to set backend that would, let's say, authenticate people um, in a normal, not in a web to in not in a web three sense, but in just normal login, where you basically have you're creating roles as admins as well as, as trainees, right? So you have to basically separate that and whatever allows you to implement, I think it's up to you. But make it very, like design it. I think my recommendation is that don't do it just out of a blue, but just design it. And if you use Next.js and it allows you to design it in a certain way, absolutely. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. Anyone else? Any other type of questions? From what you have been reading, is everything clear? Like on the project, is everyone kind of in, in the same page that they know what they are supposed to do? They are building and understanding everything at least uh, what's written or is there anything that if you ask it now it, w it would help you if so just ask it if not i assume that everything is clear therefore we can proceed to the tutorials great no question everybody
seems to understand everything. Not now. Uh, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've tried to uh, ask this question yesterday, uh, and uh, I'm still confused. Yeah. I thought I understand the, the, that part yesterday, but uh, still, I'm not 100%. So, uh, why, when we say like blockchain implementation or the uh, smart contract implementation, is that a mandatory one? Uh, so, so smart contract is not mandatory in i mean it's by mandatory it means like if you can implement it great but most people somehow it's a very your first time you might not arrive there but i would strongly advise of course if you have time to 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 start to kind of work on it right to start understand what it takes and at least attempt a few till uh, language and how to implement it but you know as always you know there's nothing mandatory and it's a part of the task and if you do it you will get credit for it so if, if you mean by that mandatory but it's you know do almost always the very first part is of course to be able to allow people to have certificates to be issued you know, opt-in and then as well as admins approve. So that part is solid. You can implement it. And then you can add features to it. And smart contract is features. You can consider them as one feature. Is that super clear now? If not, yeah. just you, you can ask it. Yeah. Okay, now home has a question, my question. Yeah, so of course the certificate, again, maybe uh, as Didia or uh, Nardos, if you are there, you can probably answer more on the approach that, that are there and why. Maybe Didia, do you wanna take that one? How you should uh -huh. serve the certificate and why certain choices? Uh, okay, so yes, uh, I was reading the question. Sorry, uh, you are going to serve. You are going to mint the asset, which is the certificate. It's it's going to be a PDF file, but you won't be uploading uh, or minting the PDF file directly into the blockchain because it's really expensive to uh, make a transaction of PDF files or even smaller files than uh, the actual PDF file. So what you are going to do is you are going to first upload the PDF or the asset, which is the certificate, into a distributed file system. Then you are going to put the metadata description or the URL of the asset, of the actual asset, into your blockchain. So we are just going to track the URL of the actual asset, not the actual asset in the blockchain. We are not going to put the actual asset in the, into, uh, we are not pushing it into the blockchain. We'll only track the URL of the asset or the certificate which is the PDF file, or it could and, also be a PNG or JPEG. Okay. And is there, for example, the idea, so what does that, like, so the URL, if someone updates it, what happens? If the, is like, so can you, like, is it that the distributed file system is one thing? And is that a unique thing just for one without an update? Yes. For example, a certificate. So just maybe to answer that so that it, it's clear for other people. Yes, every time you push, uh, maybe if you can find some uh, open source distributed file systems, every time you upload a file or an asset to the distributed file system, it will give you a unique URL being generated when the file is uploaded, and you can use that as a reference uh, so that you can track your asset uh, on your blockchain. And what if, what if you edit it? Uh, the asset, the actual asset, yeah, you will get a new URL. Exactly. So I mean, it's just a very, 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 very important point, right? You know, it's yeah. uh, it's because without it, there's no concept of Web three, right? Like the reason why Web three you can't trust something is that you don't need 
to trust the person, you need to trust the system. And the system means a smart contract you upload it, it's hashed, and you know when it's edited. You will, you know, it, it will one cannot edit it, right? So if you if now I use Ten Academy Google Drive folder, you know, to, to issue the certificate, within that, if I'm able to, you know, edit it, then the concept of so the URL is now tracked, that's fine. But the actual elements which I say like I granted you, I can say I did, you know, is not granted. Right? The certificate can be empty. Or the certificate says this person is has not been hasn't didn't complete. So the, the sense of that would be lost if things can be changed in, in a certain way. So but with that, you can, as I think, you don't, you don't want to, of course, uh, upload such big files. The storage of a blockchain is very expensive. So you really, really want to try to reduce the storage as much as possible. And that means the minimum possible information about the asset has to be connected. And that's usually a URL and some, probably some other metadata. Just the URL most of the time. Does that answer your question, Nahum? Hopefully, yes. Uh, do we have some type of language? Um, yes, to Barak, it is the teal language, is basically a specification, but you can use PyTeal to write the contract. Now, you have to, you don't have to create the back end, front end, all that to start working on the, but you have to create basically the NFT and the certificate. Of course, that can be, you know, you don't need, you can just create one and then you can connect that to the smart contract to test something. So you can write in parallel because all you need basically is just the smart contract to start. I mean, to write the contract, you don't need anything, but then to upload the contract and to test it, then you need to and you need to get you need to basically associate it with with some address and that address is the nfts one of the address it's either the managerial address or the whatever like there are four addresses that you use so you you need to connect it with that okay maybe do you want to add anything on that uh you did yeah? Uh, yes, I think I I don't think I have something to add. But uh, if you plan to implement the smart contract as well, uh, you will first need to finish the other implementation. And uh, when you start the smart contract implementation, it will be a replacement for the backend. So the smart contract in blockchain will be uh, the complete replacement of any backend app in Web two. So your smart contract will act as the backend of the Web app or the Web three app and your front end will communicate directly with the smart contracts when creating an asset and making any kind of transaction in the blockchain. Yeah. Barak, is that, does that address? Something is not clear. You can ask question. Uh, Fasa? Yeah, so, uh, um, can you Kind of, yeah. Okay, so my question is, um, Okay, this is my question. Okay, I I saw the algorithm has a backend to uh, interact with. So my question would be, uh, what exactly are we supposed to do if uh, concerning the backend we are supposed to do? If algorithm has already a backend, can't we uh, integrate our front end with that backend? And to add on what uh, was previously said about the smart contract uh maybe something related to that uh, you can tell us because i i i don't uh, really get what he meant by the smart contract is going to be used as a back end so maybe relating this topics uh brief yeah. so I, I think this is this is a good question and you know these things comes over and over as you're learning so let me try to give, to relate different things as well. When some, last time you worked on ETL or reality, there isn't one thing. Now this time you are working backend frontend. There isn't one thing. Backend frontend is 
as a, a form of thinking, right? So you can have hundreds of backends to stack together, you know, and then hundred. It's kind of like, in a way, the it's it's how you distribute, how you design them. In this case, it's there isn't only expecting one backend, and that's it. That's all the, you know, Algorand might be even connecting to another the API of the Algorand maybe has another thing to connect to. And that one has another thing to connect to. And each of them, when you are working on that side, you might call the other one backend, right? So, so it's a stack of things usually, you know, that's your, um, so in this sense, just like ETL, you know, you don't have like, at one time you may have extraction, but then you're like, yeah, like that extraction is maybe from a database. A database is, has another extraction with layer, which is extracting it from a um, certain log stream. And that one has another bucket, like kind of like that. So it can stack together, right? So the, conceptually, that is what is, it's a framework of thinking more than a simple definition. There is one backend and there is one front end. So in this case, it's the same. So Algorand offers you APIs and you can call them those ones as backend, right? That's what you mean by backend in this sense, but you can really simplify it by saying API. And now normally when you create backend, you simplify it by creating backend, like kind of API endpoints to access whatever things in that backend, right? Such that it is independent of technology. Um, so you can, you can call it from any, whether it's Python or you know, JavaScript or other other elements to it, right? So in this sense as well, what you are abstracting. So when we say now the, like that you create backend is that the one that's basically for you, you will treat as backend. That basically means if you wanna handle some kind of user authentication or you don't, you wanna change abstract, for example, in the future from Algorand to something else, to Ethereum, you know, you can wrap, you can introduce some wrapper, right? Which basically connects while still the NFT being, you know, the same service, but you can change different um, blockchains if you want to, if you abstract it, if you create your own API endpoint, right? So in that sense, that's how you can split it. And another thing is, as I said, just authentication, user authentication, user, doing some kind of web to uh, tests. Those ones are still, you have to implement it. And you can everything implement it in, of course, in one monolithic code, but then you separate it in such a way that, you know, the, the logic is sits in a certain server and you basically just, you know, someone is trying to log in, you authenticate and that authenticator can be, a, you know, your backend. So whatever is sitting, you might not even have one backend, you might have multiple backends that serve this front end, right? One backend is, you can call it the, just the actual direct um, blockchain. This is in this case, Algorand blockchain as one backend, your backend, which authenticates users and stuff. And then another one uh, that also just only concerned about wallet something. And you can have multiple backends that your front end is connected. So does that, does that, is that clear? Yeah, yeah, it actually is. It's, it's in that manner that we talk about. Now, the smart contract being the backend is, again, another form of backend where you're basically just saying like, okay, I mean, again, your, your backend can connect to the smart contract. So in this form, you can be directly from front end to backend to the smart contract or from the front end to your abstract backend, then that one connects to your smart contract, right? So the smart contract in this case can be like you would use the smart contract API call to actually do everything instead of the other side where like, for example, in um, like in a normal NFT sense, what you are saying is that you're just creating, but if your smart contract is able to create uh, an NFT, you write your smart contract such that it creates a like given a something, given a certain condition that it creates an, an NFT for you, then great, you know, you just only connect with that, with that condition. So that's what by uh, when uh, UDDS says that one can act because the smart contract is able to create an NFT for you. Like you can write it in such a way that if certain conditions satisfy, 
then it creates uh, that. So you don't need to do anything. Like, um, you know, the admin don't need to mint whatever stuff. That one time, able to, you can write it in a, in in the smart contract. Do you want to add anything on that, Yididia? Or also, if, if, if your question is not answered, you, you should ask it again in, in a way that is not answered. No, actually, uh, it, it is answered, but I have another question. So maybe I will ask them later. Okay. After some yeah, Yididia, do you want to add on what, on that one, if anything I'm missing, that makes no. it probably more clear? Yes, I think that was clear. Okay. Great. And yep, and net. Oh, I forgot to just drop it down. My, uh, it's been answered. I was going to ask, uh, uh, what do we mean by the smart contract that says act as a banking agent? You've already answered it. So, yeah. Right. So we we have a API. We can have an API call. We do we have an API a specific API that will let us to access the smart contract? Yeah. Because normally it's a smart contract would have an address and any transaction sent to that address will be handled by the smart contracts code. So we, so we can access the Algorand X, uh, address in the unique ID of the smart contract to like communicate with, with it. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, in, in this case, the block, it's basically like the smart contract has an address. And you just use that, you know, you, you issue a transaction to that address. And then it, of course, the, your transaction, you know, the, the, the kind of commands or you know, that smart contract has exposed certain functions, how you call it, inputs and outputs, right? And then when you happen to call the right thing, then it will do the right thing, you know, what you specified. So can we, like, uh, for example, in a traditional uh, API, we can uh, request some something, like, and we'll get a, a response back. So, but in this case, I, uh, can we have the same kind of uh, uh, condition? For example, if we want to uh, get, uh, for example, let's say uh, I want to, I have a public address of uh, some, like, uh, user, so I just uh, send that public address to the uh, smart contract and like, uh, and I wanted to know if I'm allowed to do certain tasks. So like, is there a way to get some kind of response, like specific response from the smart contract? So like, can we do that when we write the smart contract? Yeah, so, so when you, you can query what functions, what are exposed in that smart contract. So that's basically as if like the documentation of it, right? So, and then you can query, it's a function, basically you know, a smart contract is some function, right? You're kind of, you're kind of calling it in a certain manner and it would act depending on the inputs you give and depending on which function you called, um, then it, it's basically proceed and computes the code that's written for that, right? So you're basically, the, the address is exposing that, right? And then there is a, your way of like, I mean, I'm just trying to find a visual way if, um, um, so I, there is a way that would be great. Uh, Just that will be easier sometimes. The indexer is the, like uh, the one that allows us to yeah. query yeah. it, right? Uh, I'm just... Yes. Uh, um... Mm 
Yeah. So I don't find any very nice visual way, uh, but I will send one if I find uh, maybe in the image section, if there is. Uh, so, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I will, I will, I will search instead of just now. I will find and, and search. So, so this is basically what I am much more just even if it's simple. So, you know, this is basically the, the type of smart contract you are writing. Like in, if we look at the Python version. So, so the so the transaction has a throne. Uh, so and. So this is the contract address, right? And now, so the create logic structure and the load. And so this is basically, and then sign transaction with. So this is when you are actually when actually internally that you are like when the smart contract actually is creating a transaction on behalf of you. Um, So, yeah, I still, but I, I will find, but it's basically what you really are exposing ultimately is, yeah, like you, it's your code and what, what values that um, you are saving and, and you are basically triggering it, right? You are triggering it based on a certain input, a valid input and and the smart contract can call another smart contract. So if you think of it as a code, like you have a main code that calls many other things that does, that calls other functions um, to do a certain goal. And that goal could be like given a trainee and this and that data, it's to mint the, you know, you mint and associate transfer. Uh, so you mint a, an NFT and transfer it to like a person, like a trainee in this case, right? So that things you can do, uh, and that's why it's, you're able to do all of the like, the kind of minting and and creating NFTs and then associating them. You can do it in your um, in your in your smart contract, and that acts exactly. You know the same as the same as like backend. If we were to do that by yourself, not so smart contract. I don't know if that if that addresses your your question, but ask it in, in different way if that doesn't address. Yeah, it, it addressed it. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. So, uh, where are we supposed to deploy this on the test network? Because I think the main network costs money or something. Yes. Right? Yeah. So on uh, if you have already the what it's called in the local the development version, which is the you know that you can initiate, you can also do that test it there. But then ultimately, yeah, deploy it on the test train. Okay. And. Uh, Maybe you can say something, or maybe I can say something about what the Algorand node and the indexer node is, and what their similarity and differences, and how they work together. 
Yeah, uh, Idilia, do you want to? Also maybe, uh, also, maybe the KDM, KMD or KD. Uh, okay, so the KMD, the indexer in the uh, D1, the API that we have been working on on yesterday session are the ways that we can access the Algorand API. So the Algorand API is the wrapper on the uh, on the actual smart contract that they provide so that we can access the implementation directly using the API. So one of the way is to use the KMD, the other is the indexer, and the one was the one we used on yesterday, on yesterday session. So there are just different ways of accessing their implementation. Is, is, is that, so the, the API is the same, right? You're just pointing to different things? Or, uh, um, or is, that, is that the test and development part? Like, uh, so there are different features, of course, with different uh, test nets. You, you can have multiple test nets, but in this case, what what is the? Are we talking about like so? You use the same API in all of them, except just which one you are accessing is different, or is it a different type of API? It's just in this. I don't know. KMT one. Uh, the KMT one is also the other uh, in the point API in the point available by Algorand. The algo, the algo D, the KMD, and the indexer are the available API endpoints. They have different token and address uh, given yeah. for each. So that means it's basically different. Let's call it the sandbox is one, right? Mm. So, but sandbox is just it's an you can call it a node, an empty node that you populate yourself. A testnet is a node like or multiple nodes that that are populated, pre-populated already, and you can create. But and then you may have another test, test name that is kind of on a newer version of the SDK. Like, for example, Algorand has updated certain things. They might create for that, let's say, instead of pure proof of stake, they might be attempting pure proof of stake version two. Then they can create that. And then they will provide, of course, an endpoint for that, right? Is that is that are we talking in that manner of like you know different because i know there are also version mismatches between different ones or kind of implementation differences for example in the form of uh, ethereum you may have proof of work proof of stake and many other test nets right so they have different names of course um and the way that it's even kind of the, your implementation differs, of course, from or at least the protocol differs. So in this case, are we talking about that, right? It's like all are like a, a network that you can access um, with a different, let's call it URL, but similar API structure. Uh, the, the, the API structure is similar among uh... yeah of the APIs, but I think they have different functions. The algo D is mostly used for transactions, uh, and the KMD one is for key management mostly, and the indexer one is for the historical data, to access historical data on the blockchain. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's basically uh, different ways of accessing uh, the network, but with slightly different uh, applications, let's call them, or different things we do. For key management, we use the KMD for the transactions and asset management, we use the Algorand main node and to see the transaction, we basically use the indexer. Is that what you're saying? Mm, yes, yes. Those are the available API endpoints to access different uh, endpoints on the blockchain, on the Algorand blockchain. Okay. So, so yeah, okay. I, I think Ultimately, you know, the way you would understand it, of course, the simplification and searching, uh, if you need to search something, you probably do it the same in, in, it's easier or there might not be a convenient way that someone can provide another endpoint that would help you locate it. And then the same is probably, I mean, I, I'm 
just now not sure i haven't used it myself so i'm talking from a general perspective but ultimately what you're what you are doing is that a lot of these things are sometimes simplification sometimes they are done for testing some new technologies or some new versions or sometimes in this case for locating or managing and all of them though can be given within the certain SDK you know they are available just um, so I, I, is that does that, yeah, is that clear this yeah yeah yes yes that makes so much sense okay great uh, Johannes and then we will stop here because we are running out of time so I think it's uh, we'll then hand it over to you Didia to continue the wallet uh, connection tutorial okay Johannes okay thank you Bo. so my my question is on the do, do we use just the testnet or they i'm a little bit confused here i tried both of them and still two of them are refusing so i don't know where i'm making the mistake i mean i'm trying to to, to connect it locally so which one should i use between what between i mean uh, when i when i'm just running the sandbox up do i use a command dev or testnet just trying to, 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 to for the first transaction i think it, you should use just the dev and that populates for you some accounts and then from that on it will be faster but maybe Edidia, do you have any recommendation on that uh, yeah I, I think you should use the dev network because it, it will be much more faster than the testnet in the main network and it will also give you some accounts uh, but i'm not exactly sure what problem you are facing i think you, you are solving the problem the on... problem is i mean uh, yeah just like you just uh, uh, taught us yesterday i tried to list the, the accounts so there are no accounts i mean there, there must be at least a three or a two uh, default accounts right private are you on the so or on the uh, actually i have tried both of them and uh, i'm actually reinstalling it again to just try it Okay, if there are no accounts available on your sandbox, you can also go ahead and create a new account. Then fill up your account with some algos, right? Yeah, exactly. I have actually tried is that so I just go to the Algorand Explorer and uh, dispense it. It still says it's uh, zero micro algos. Yeah, but you it's can create asking me to create the wallet. You, you, you can create your own, you know, private and public key, add it and so, but then you need to give it, definitely you need to, I mean, there should be, if you start the development, it would really by, by automatically create. Um, I, I think I, I know where the problem is, but I just, it's just an assumption. The thing is, if he's, uh, if you are, as, um, if you're using the faucet to get the algorithms and the test network, but that, that, and test network. that is not coming, yeah, but if that's not the coming in your environment, yeah, but the thing is uh, here, the, um, sorry, yellow, but I'm really sorry, but not to take uh, more, much, much time, but I think the problem lies when he is using the faucet, the algorithm is going to be populated in the test network, but if he is using the uh, local or the development uh, IP address or the local nodes to get that uh, to see that transaction he's not going to be able to get it so he needs to actually access the test networks uh, ip address or budget i you think know, that's I think the, 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 the dave like if you just initiate it the dave will just create for you the, the always whether it's your johannes or Pesa will create because it's in a locally will create the usual addresses and populate them with the same amount so if it works for me, it should work for you. There's nothing different. On the test net is the other side, but on the dev net, it's just basically this local there and the sandbox and it will create and it will show you the addresses it creates and the amount that they have. Yeah, exactly. So, so he should, should maybe use the dev net. Yeah. 
Exactly. I, I, I just thought he was using the test. No, I just he said he tried both. So let's just step by step, one by one. In this case, just try it, just step net, and I think it should work. Okay, let me try it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. If it still doesn't work, maybe you can debug that together after the session runs. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay, so also Nathaniel seems to just, Nathaniel Masrasha, he seems to work. Because, he, yeah, in principle, it may be just some, I don't know, your computer slowed down and didn't create that, and you hope, you know, something like that, but it should work. Like, um, okay, great. I hope that was helpful. Uh, I hope people were able to ask at least some of the questions. Um, and yeah, go on, Nidia. Thanks, everyone. Uh, okay, so today's session is going to be on wallet integration. Uh, on a Saturday session, I think we've all seen why we need uh, wallet for key management. And uh, uh, on today's session, we are going to look at how we can use wallet. And we are also going to look at some popular uh, wallets for Algorand. And that will only focus on one of the wallets that are that, that, that's available on the browser. So. Uh, a crypto wallet is a software or hardware designed for storing public and private keys representing a particular set of crypto. And it works like traditional wallet providing proof of ownership for your digital cash. So uh, if you remember on yesterday's session, we had to uh, manually put our private key when signing a transaction. And we had to remember or we had to keep note of our private key when making any kind of transaction. What wallet does is it will store the private key and the public key for us, and it will make the management much more easier and faster. And some of the examples of uh, Algo wallets are, the first one is the Algo wallet. This is the best web-based extension. It, it has an extension on the Chrome browser, and you can easily use it with the web app. The other ones are the Pera wallet, which is the best one as well, and the most compatible with Algorand wallet. There is the Ledger, Nano X, most secure hardware wallet, Trust wallets, and Atomic wallets. Uh, these are the available wallets on Algorand. Uh, today, we'll uh, mostly focus on the Algo wallet, how we can use Algo wallet on our front-end application and how we can integrate it with our, our, with our Algorand app. So why we need a wallet? I think this is something that we have discussed on yesterday's session. Uh, so to just go over it, a wallet is composed of two parts, the public address and the private key. And the link between uh, a public key and a private key is rooted in the public-private key cryptography. And it's what puts the crypto in the cryptocurrency. And in order to receive your purchase tokens of real estate, you will need an Algorand wallet so that uh, the assets can be delivered to you. So every time when someone wants to make a transaction or uh, wants to change the state of the blockchain, uh, we have seen that there are about six types of transactions that can change the state of the blockchain and on each uh, state of the blockchain we need we are making some kind of transaction which needs our uh, uh, which needs our signature to be able to commit it into to commit it into the blockchain so to sign that we need a wallet which will make uh, the entire process or the entire flow much more easier and faster and the most important thing to remember about wallets is to make sure uh, to save your private keys. These private keys allow you to access your wallet and if they are lost, you lose access to your wallet. Uh, so we need to make sure that we have a copy of uh, our key uh, to the wallet. So what makes the wallets or the key management different from the actual wallet that we use uh, in bank system or other systems is that uh, if you lose if you lose our account of our bank our bank account, we can go ahead and ask the bank manager or someone to recover account, our account. But uh, in blockchain, if we lose our account key or our wallet key, we will no longer have access to the uh, blockchain account. Even if we have some algos, we won't be able to access them. So it's really important that we keep, uh, 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 we have those keys stored in some areas other than uh, in the wallet itself. So we need to make sure that we save them uh, somewhere private, not to be accessed by anyone. 
but we need to have a copy so that uh, we won't lose access to our account. Uh, so the key generation algorithm takes a random value as an, as an input and outputs to 32 uh, byte arrays representing a public key and its associated private key. Uh, I think this is something that we covered on Monday session, but just to go over them, uh, this key generation, the algorithm's algorithm generates the private key and the public key. And uh, when signing, we need the first one is the sender, which uses uh, to send any kind of transaction or to mint an asset or uh, to change any uh, to change the state of the blockchain, we need the public key first. But when we are going to sign or when we are going to verify uh, uh, the signature, we need the private key to uh, to be able to commit to the blockchain. So this is the generation that Algorand uses. There is the random seed, and the generator generates the public key and the private key. And after generating the private key and the corresponding address, sending algos to the address on the Algorand will initialize its state on the Algorand blockchain. So uh, unless an account has sent uh, a transaction or a, an, an account starts to make a transaction, Algorand won't know uh, of the existence of that specific public address. So you might create an account on the Algorand, but uh, it won't get initialized into the Algorand blockchain. Once you start to make a transaction, it will be integrated to the Algorand blockchain and Algorand, the, the blockchain of Algorand will make note of that public address. Uh, we can use this reference. Uh, I can share this slide to you uh, so that you can have a reference. Uh, so the first thing that I can do is maybe I can, mm, let me share my entire screen and, Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, to install the Algo Signer extension, you just go to the Algo Signer uh, Chrome extension, and you'll have to install it. Let me just stop it. Into the chat. Uh, and uh, it's just a simple Chrome extension. After installing it. To create an account, you just press the extension. Let me pin that and uh, you need to put a password that you'll remember. This password will be used when uh, anytime that you are going to access the wallet, you will need to provide this access key. So you need to keep these keys uh, safe because if you lose this key or if you forget this key, uh, you won't be able to access this uh, wallet. And I will create the wallet. Okay, okay so uh, currently I don't have any account uh, on my wallet. So what I can do is uh, I can go to the testnet. You can create an account uh, or an address on the mainnet or the testnet. I'll go to the testnet and uh, you can add an account. So if you have an existing account, you can import that account. Uh, for now, I'm going to create a new account. Uh, maybe each. And what this will do is it will give me uh, the 32 words or the mnemonic phrase. Uh, I have the public address and the mnemonic, uh, the mnemonic words, which are the 25 word uh, mnemonic uh, keys. And I need to also keep this safe because uh, this is what will, uh, uh, I will only be able to access my private key using this mnemonic address and the public address is also available. You can just copy this and after putting or after storing it uh, somewhere, maybe let me just take a picture. And uh, and yeah, obviously you don't have to share this to anyone. I will delete this account. So what it will ask you then is it will uh, uh, it will prompt you to put the 
mnemonic keys in the exact order that it showed you earlier. So the first one was just and Uh, okay, uh, this might take a while, but uh, what you'll do is you'll put the 25 word mnemonic address on uh, exactly on the sequence that it showed you earlier. And after you put that, uh, you can continue and your account will be created. For now, I'm going to use uh, my own Algo account that I, that I have on my other router. Uh, so, on the testnet, I have a couple of accounts. So some of them have some algos and some of them also have some assets. Uh, so you'll have a list of accounts once you create the account by entering the mnemonic phrase and uh, you can dispense them and even create assets using those accounts. This will be uh, on the testnet and you can also switch to the minute once you want to start uh, making a transaction on the minute, you can switch to the minute and uh, start making a transaction, a transaction if you have some algos. Uh, so to go over to this section. Okay, so I've initialized a basic React application. So uh, the wallet integration is with the front end and you can use any front end uh, that you prefer, any of the front-end frameworks. I've just initialized a React application and I've uh, made a very simple uh, React app. Let me start the, uh, let me start the app. So, uh, let me first show you the logic that uh, I've implemented, then uh, we can go over the code implementation. Yes, so the first thing that we can do is, uh, if you remember yesterday, we need, uh, we were using our private key when making each uh, transaction. So when we're minting an asset or when we're creating an asset, we used our uh, private key to sign the transaction. We, when we are also uh, going to send uh, an algorand to an algo to someone, we used our uh, uh, we used our uh, private key statically uh, each time we wanted to make a transaction. So by using wallet, we will uh, we won't need to use our uh, private key uh, statically and our wallet will be able to manage all of those uh, processes. So the first thing is I'm going to connect to my wallet. So when connecting to the wallet, uh, uh, the algo signer extension will pop up and uh, it will request uh, uh, it will uh, ask me to allow access for the application. I will grant access, so it's now connected. And uh, one thing I can do is I can select the list. Uh, I can select from the list of the public ac uh, from the public address because I have a couple of accounts. I have about five accounts. I can select the uh, one of the accounts that, that that's available. I will just select one of them. Since I'm going to send or transfer some algos, let me maybe select, uh, okay, let me maybe select the admin. The admin's, uh, the admin's address is 4CA. It starts with 4CA, so I'll select this account and I'm going to transfer it to, uh, maybe to the manager and the manager's address is Okay, uh, so the admin has about 5.9 algos and the manager has one algo. So uh, let me just send three algo from the admin to the manager. So three algo means three million micro algos. And when I click transfer, the extension will pop up again and uh, I'll put my password. and the transaction is successful. And if I now go, yes, we can see that uh, from one algo, it has increased to four algos and 
the admin has uh, the, the admin's algo has decreased from five algos to two algos because I've sent three algos from the admin to the manager. Uh, so this has been implemented fully using the wallet integration, and we didn't need to use the uh, private key uh, on our application statically. So if we now go to the application. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is we need to, uh, on on the app level, I, I will try not to go over the React implementation because we'll have a separate session on Thursday by the Tenix team uh, on building front-end application. I will just go over the logic that we need to uh, use when implementing or when integrating the wallet with our application. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to uh, comment out the global algo signer. What this will do is it will inject the algo signer into our application into in the global level, and it will be a global uh, variable, and we can access it uh, from our application. Uh, so just to show you that uh, there are lots of global elements that are available uh, that are available in the HTML. So if you go to the window, uh, there are lots of functions and. Uh, uh, so as you can see here, algo signer is also added to the global functions. The other one are the alert. For example, you can access alert from anywhere in your application. The same way that you can access alert you, uh, in order to access algo signer, what you need to do is you just need to put uh, this specific line of code in top of your application. So this will inject algo signer into your application in the global state, and you can access it from any uh, part of your application. Or, or your code section. So after using this line uh, in the in the beginning of your app.js app file in React or any other uh, front-end framework, you can then use the algo signer uh, to send a transaction, to sign a transaction or so on. So uh, I just used uh, the React strap to uh, uh, just to make it a bit uh, a bit more uh, uh, a bit more uh, Good to look at uh, the application. I haven't spent much time, but I just built the basic components, which will enable us to connect to the algorand to the wallet, and then uh, accept a public key that a public address that we are going to send, and the amount that we are going to send to the public address. Uh, so after uh, uh, after connecting, so to connect to the account, what uh, we can do is uh, we have this function because the algo signer is now available in the global state of our application. We can say that, let me remove this, and we can say uh, algo signer dot connect. So algo signer dot connect will connect to the uh, to the wallet. And after connecting to the wallet, what we can do next is we can uh, to get the accounts to to get the list of accounts. We will first connect to the testnet. So uh, as you have seen earlier, we can connect to the main net or to the test net. So to specify uh, to which uh, network that we are going to connect, we'll specify the ledger property and we'll connect to the test net. But if you are going to work on the main net, we'll use the main net instead of the test net. Then after connecting to the test net, uh, we'll get all of the available account uh, on that browser. Since I have about five accounts, I've uh, we have seen that we have uh, I refresh this up. Uh, uh, we, uh, we can see that we have about five accounts when we list uh, our list of accounts. And after connecting that, uh, before doing this, actually, we can first check if the user has installed the algo signer extension. There is a specific code to check for that. Check if algo signer. Yes. Yes. So the first thing is, uh, if you check if type of algo signer is not defined, this means that our uh, this means that algo signer is not installed on the user's browser. So we need to prompt or we need to request we need to ask the user to install the algo signer uh, extension before uh, uh, before using our application. So we we can first check if the user has installed 
the Algosan extension. If not, we we'll request him to uh, install that extension. But if he has already installed the extension, we can go ahead and connect to uh, to the uh, wallet and uh, go on with the transactions. So after connecting to the uh, after connecting to the wallet, what you can do is we can uh, use the same thing that we used yesterday. We can transfer an asset. We can uh, we can create an asset. We can uh, send a transaction. Is it a question? Andrew? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah, the previous uh, code like that we uh, the technique that we used to check if the Argo signer has been installed. So that is just for the vanilla JavaScript, right? So in this case, we can just use the Algo signer object and check if that uh, if it is undefined and go along. Yes. Yes. So, uh, so we don't have the document object, I think, in React, right? That's I think. Uh, Vanilla. Uh, just forget this. This is just specifying. Uh, okay, let me just go over. This is also a very good uh, documentation. Let me share this to you and uh, let me go over uh, what the, this is an example. So, to first check, yeah, as you can see, the algo signer is installed. It's just rendering the HTML and uh, just uh, rendering the algo signer is installed. It's writing that the algo signer is installed in the inner HTML. If not, it will write the algo signer is not installed. We'll implement our own lo logic. We'll just use the algo signer object to check if the algo signer is installed or not. If not, we'll use our own logic on the React side or any other uh, front end framework application that we are going to use. Oh, okay, I get it. So this is just rendering the HTML. Uh, last name? Uh, I have one question. Uh, okay. What is the point of like using the algo signer if we uh, if we implement or if you use the uh, SDK? For example, if you use uh, separate backing SDK, for example, in a case like if I implement Django in the backing and if I use the Python SDK, what is okay. exactly like uh, just to get the account address, like logging with uh, address? What is the logic here if we want to uh, use a parent? Okay. Uh, let me just ask you a question. So let's say that you are, uh, for example, yes, you want to make a transaction. Let's just use this app. You want to make a transaction and you want to send someone uh, some algos. And you implemented the Python SDK. Let's say you have a Python on your backend and you are using the, Py the Python SDK. And uh, you are first asking the user to enter the public address that he wants to send some algos in the amount that he wants to send, right? Yes. Uh, then you are going to ask his private key, his or her private key, because you won't be able to sign that transaction if you don't have access to his private key. Okay, right? so... So what oh. you can do is, uh, what we did yesterday was, uh, we used the private key of each public address and we used that statically and we entered that, uh, that, uh, that private key when signing the transaction. But on a real world application, we won't ask our users to enter their private keys for each transaction that they're going to make. Yes. Oh, what are, what are we supposed to do here? Like if we if we are using this apparently. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, is it from my side or you're you're a bit, you're breaking nothing? Else. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. So, what are we supposed to do here? Like... Okay. So, uh, for example, let's say that I'm going to send you some algos. Uh, Maybe uh, have you created a uh, an algo account? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, can you send me your public address? Okay.
I just dropped it in the chat. Okay. Uh, let me see this amalgus. Uh, let me see this three amalgus. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, on the code section, maybe before I go to, before I send the transaction, uh, on the code section, we are using the same uh, logic that we used yesterday. We are first defining uh, the parameters that we need when sending a transaction. So I'm specifying the from property, the to property, the amount that I'm going to send, the note in the suggest parameter, the, the, the suggest params, which are the default parameters. Then uh, on yesterday's session, when signing the transaction, we used the private key statically, right? We used the private key. So uh, for example, if my private key was something like this, I used this uh, private key statically when signing the transaction. But when the app, let's say you have sold this application to an organization that's going to make lots of transaction, you won't be requesting the organization to put their private key into your application. You won't ask your, uh, your customers to enter their private key because once someone has access to your private key, they will have access to your entire account. They can control all of your assets, your algos, and everything that you have in your account. So while it's, what Wallet does is it will, uh, it will, uh, it will make the transaction signing process on in, in a very secure way and you won't have to use your private key uh, on your application. It will abstract that process and you can uh, you can just click a button and without even getting your private key, you will be able to make a transaction. Your transaction will be signed and unless your transaction is signed, it won't be committed to your blockchain, to the Algorand's blockchain. So for every transaction to be committed into the blockchain and verified by the blockchain, it needs to be signed. So unsigned transactions aren't committed to the blockchain. And to sign that, we need the private key and we won't use that private key uh, in public applications. So while it's, while it's uh, the algo signer and other wallets such as Ledger and other uh, wallets will act that implementation and it will make the signature on behalf of the user without exposing your private key. Uh, so if I now just sign, I just need the uh, key that I used, the, not the key, but the password that I used when signing up for the application. Okay, transaction successful. Uh, yes. Uh, the three algos has been deducted from my account. Uh, Nathaniel, can you check your account? Yeah, I have received three algos. Yes, use it wisely. As you can see, uh, I'm sending, I'm making a transaction on the on this on this week's uh, project implementation. Uh, not only the trainer is going to use the application or make a signature, the trainee is also going to use the application and make a signature. Needs to make a signature because. When opting in for an asset, that's a transaction on, on Algorand, right? So when someone is going to opt in, when someone is going to create an asset, there are lots of transactions happening on your application. So for each transaction, you won't be using uh, someone's private key statically in the application. We want something that will abstract the process and uh, sign on behalf of that user without exposing his or her public key. Not public, but his or her private key. Okay, so like using the Python's one will be like pointless here. No, 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 no. Okay, so I think. Uh, okay, I will go over that uh, uh, later. But okay. the Python, if you are using Python or JavaScript or Java, we'll use those. Uh, okay, the the confusion might be because I've just used the React implementation, so. As Yabubal said earlier, I have used all of the logic on my application, on a single uh, application, but we want to abstract the logic. And uh, as you can see from the application, we are just getting the public address in the amount. So to abstract the implementation, 
we just have to use on the front end. The, the best thing to do is to just get the public address and the amount that we send, we want to send for someone and implement the uh, uh, implement the other the parameter generation and other process on the back end. So one of the things is you will wait for the confirmation after signing a transaction, right? And you can implement those logics on the back end and you can wrap it around by using an API. So your backend might just uh, form the JSON object and return the object that's going to be signed to the front end. So on the front end, the front end's job will be to only sign that transaction. And again, the backend will uh, might verify that transaction and wait for the confirmation. And finally, after it has been confirmed, after it has been confirmed, it can return that back to the front end. So you can use any uh, backend uh, application. You can use Python, you can use JavaScript, you can use Java or so on. But on the front end, we want to abstract it as much as we can because we just want uh, we just want to use what is relevant for the front end. We just want to uh, get the address or when minting an asset, we just want to get maybe the public address of the trainee and some uh, other relevant informations and the backend will implement the logic, will create the algo client and so on. And the, uh, the token that has been generated will be returned to the front end to be signed by the algo signer and the front end will handle the signing process. Okay, thank you, it's clear now. Okay. Uh, yes? Yeah, uh, I think on my side, I have a, a serious problem. I, I think that I'm understanding what we have to do, what we have to do in theory, but I can't start in practice. And I, I, I'm seeing that you are using GS, and I don't know, I don't have any experience with that, and I don't have also any experience with reading an app in the past. So it's somehow hard. hard I mean, don't do anything, so I don't know how to solve that. Uh, okay, yeah, I think uh, this might be a challenge for you, but when you are working, when you are planning to work on Web3 related projects, you can't skip the, uh, especially the front end implementation. You might implement most of your logics on the back end, but you will definitely need uh, a front end. Uh, to serve your application. So what I can recommend you is to start learning front-end application, front-end frameworks like React or any other front-end framework to build and serve your application. Just, uh, you don't have to learn everything for this week. There are lots of templates that you can use and understanding the basic concept might just be enough and reaching out for help uh, might also uh, be helpful. Okay, but I, I'm seeing that you are not using uh, you are not using Python code. So should I use JS like you or for the front end? Yes, for the front end. Uh, okay, so there is the Python side implementation for the front end. If you are comfortable with that, you can also use the Python version. Uh, if not, I'm not uh, comfortable with that. I haven't used that uh, until now, but currently JavaScript is the dominating one uh, for front-end applications. So I highly recommend you to use, to focus on React or some other front-end application, especially for those of you that are planning to focus or that are going to choose Web3 track. It's a must thing uh, to learn front-end framework, one of the front-end frameworks and be really comfortable uh, on using them. Okay. And if you have any material that you think that would help me. Uh, oh, I okay, will... yes. I, I think <laughs> I'll try to share some materials, but uh, I will also try to look for some templates, especially there are lots of templates when building React applications and any other uh, front end frame framework application. And by using those templates, you just need to customize them uh, based on your needs and serve your 
uh, content on those applications. I will try to look for that, and everyone, anyone in the call as well can share uh, resources that will be helpful. Thank you. Okay, Antoinette. <coughs> It was a mistake, sorry. Okay, Mohammed. Uh, so uh, I'm kind of uh, confused. Can you elaborate or give me uh, uh, a clear steps uh, to address this week uh, project? Like uh, first, first thing is to initialize the sandbox and second thing to do this and third thing to do this. So I could uh, have a basic understanding of what I'm going to do next. Okay, maybe uh, can you try to uh, just go over the steps? Can you just tell me the steps, what you have understood on what to implement on this week's project? And then I, I just can go over and uh, maybe show you the entire step that maybe you are missing or not clear or things that are not that that are, that are not clear so okay basically i have uh, to initialize the sandbox and uh, then uh, the, the next step and it's not clear for me is uh, try to um, doing a, an abi that fetch uh, some data from uh, the the algo algorand uh, blockchain, and to, to present that data with uh, a front end uh, web application. Is it is it that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's right. But. Uh... We can go into the detail. Okay, let me just go over the details as well. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to be able to connect to the testnet or the devnet. So uh, the the reason that you are initial is in you are uh, starting the container of sandbox. The sandbox container is to be to be able to connect to the uh, testnet or the devnet. You can use the sandbox or the PureStake API to connect to the testnet. After connecting to the testnet, what you are supposed to do is you have two uh, separate user stories. The first one is as an admin of the organization, the admin should be able to mint an asset. And as by asset, uh, I mean that the admin needs to be able, needs to be able to mint the certificates of each trainee. And after minting the certificates of each trainee, the trainee should be able to opt in for the assets that the the admin or the owner of the organization has minted. So only minted certificates or only created assets can be opted in by the training side. So the admin needs to first mint the asset. After the asset has been minted, an asset ID can be generated from the minted asset. And using that asset ID, the trainee should be able to opt in by using that specific asset ID. After the trainee has opted in, the trainer can be able to send that asset to the trainee. So on Algorand's implementation, an asset can be transferred to someone. I can't transfer an asset. I can't transfer uh, uh, some asset. Maybe let's say I have minted your certificate, Mohammed, and I can't transfer your asset uh, to you. I can't transfer the asset to you unless you opt in. So opting in means requesting a specific asset that has been generated for you. So there will be a unique identifier for each asset that are being minted on the blockchain. And by using that specific asset, you will be requesting uh, for that asset. So in other words, it means that I want that asset and uh, uh, just transfer that asset to me. So when you request that, I can now be able to send that asset to you. So after I mint uh, your certificate, I will get an asset ID for your specific certificate. Then by using that asset ID, you should be able to request or opt in for that asset. After you request that asset, I will then be able to transfer that asset to you. And that will complete the, so, uh, the implementation. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, 
the steps of uh, signing assets and uh, initializing some organizations uh, wallets and uh, accounts um i i couldn't understand that at all uh, did that uh, did you uh, explain that in the yesterday uh, uh, session a uh, tutorial uh, the evening tutorial uh, yes yes that was covered on yesterday's session uh, if you missed that i think you can yes. go uh, to the youtube session and Yes, yes, I, I can uh, uh, attend the session, but I couldn't understand because uh, I didn't initialize the sandbox and connect it to the testnet. So uh, uh, basically, okay, so... I, I, will, I will just... Okay, go, come on. Uh, okay, so if you're still having... If you're still... Sorry. Uh, if you're still facing a problem connecting to the, to the sandbox, there is an alternative that you can use, which is the PureStack API. So the PureStack API is another way of accessing the, uh, the algorand's mainnet and testnet. By using that API, it will provide you an access token and an access address. By using those uh, parameters, you'll be able to connect to the blockchain, mainnet or testnet, then perform any type of transaction that you want to do. So uh, basically, uh, the steps that I should uh, do uh, for now is finish. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. I think there is a lock. Hello. Uh, uh, is it from my side? Uh, anyone okay. can uh, someone? Basically, I, I, I must, I must talk. Uh, okay, I can hear you, Mohammed. Go on. Hello. So, uh, basically, uh, I should do first uh, initializing uh, proof of stake API or sandbox. Uh, which one worked for me, I would uh, proceed with that. Then I should connect the testnet. Uh, then I must uh, watch uh, yesterday uh, uh, tutorial and perform uh, the steps that you did yesterday. Yes. And uh, finally, what I should do after uh, the assets uh, steps Uh, okay, so then you will need to build your uh, front-end application. So you are serving the contents to your end users or customers, which might be the training organization or Ten Academy in this case, in our case. So you need to build a front-end application that will that will enable the training administrator to uh, to mint an asset of each trainee, and on the trainee side to be able to opt in for a specific asset. And finally, on the admin side, to be able to send them the opted-in assets to the training. So, uh, okay, I, I got that. Uh, uh, I have uh, one question, uh, which is, yes, uh, for the interim uh, submission uh, in the technical side, well, at which step uh, I should submit my code, uh, the asset, uh, uh, the asset uh, task or the front end task uh i think it would be based to uh, uh we are looking forward to see what you have been trying to do uh on the interim submission until wednesday so mostly you've been trying to understand the concept of, of blockchain on monday and trying to figure out how to start the sandbox and interact with the uh, blockchain on the test on the testnet or the devnet so you will have to at least try to connect to the testnet or the devnet and make some kind of transaction. You might just create an asset, you might transfer some algos to, from one account to the other. You might be using that statically, it's okay, but we need to see some of the logic that you've been trying to do uh, by interacting with the uh, Python or any other language SDKs. And at least you need to initialize your front-end framework and uh, you might not uh, 
uh, progress much on the front end, but you should at least initialize your front end application and start the logic. But you don't expect much on the in-stream submission for the front end, but you should at least initialize a front end application and just start uh, a very simple uh, implementation of your fr front end. So it would be based to have the design layout of your application. So if you are thinking of something, how you can uh, structure your application on the front end, having a design is really key when working on the front end. So if you have a design that you have tried to come up with, try to include that uh, on your in-stream submission, try to include that on the readme or somewhere, that would be really good uh, for you. But especially we'll more focus, uh, we'll be focusing more on the uh, backend logic of your implementation. Okay, thank you, I got that. Okay, uh, Gideon. Uh, my question is on, is on the opting in part. So, uh, do we have to like implement the 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 how the train is obtained ourselves, the logic, or does Algorand have a way of like implementing that? Uh, the opting in part or the logic? Uh, yes, the opting in part. Uh, Algorand has already. There is the Python SDK, there is the SDK part implementation for opting in. Uh, I think we have seen that on yesterday's session, right? Uh, let me open it on this browser. I'll go. Oh. Yes, so here's the logic. So in the Java, maybe let me show you uh, the Python logic. Uh, so uh, the parameters are the same when that it's the same parameter that you use when creating an asset, transferring an, transferring some an asset or uh, making some kind of transaction. The only thing that is different when opting in is you will be sending the sender will be uh, in this week's challenge. The sender will be the trainee, so the admin is the one that is going to mint the certificate, and the trainee is the one that's going to opt in for that specific certificate or for that specific asset. So the sender in our case will be the trainee. So we'll use the trainee's public address or public key. Then we'll also give the parameters. Then the receiver, uh, sorry. Uh, so the receiver will be, uh, this should be the the admin. This should be the admin, the account tree. I don't know why they use the account tree. Uh, yes, because, the, 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 Okay, uh, the, the the receiver is the one that that minted that asset. So if you are the one that uh, minted the asset, you'll use uh, the sender and the receiver might be the same. But uh, in our implementation, the sender the receiver will be the one that uh, minted the asset. So the uh, actually no, sorry. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I will look into this, but I think the receiver should be, yes, yes, I'm sorry. The sender and the receiver are going to be the same because you are saying that you are requesting this specific asset ID for this specific ID. so you are the sender of the transaction. So it is going to uh, uh, charge you some algos, which is 0 0.01 algos, and the receiver is going to be you as well. The only thing that's different when opting in is you are opting in for zero amount. So you are not uh, 
you are not sending any uh, any assets amount you are opting in for zero assets so this is how our grant will be able to identify if you are opting in or not so when you are when you are when you are going to make a transaction your amount will probably be different you might send 10 20 or some amount of assets but when opting in you use zero as the amount and you'll be opting in using the asset id so when the admin mints your certificate the admin should be able to get the asset id for that uh, specific asset and you are minting you are opting in using that specific asset id so once you opt in for that asset the trainer will be able to send that asset or the trainer will be able to transfer that asset to you okay so the only difference is just setting the amount to zero to opt in. yes yes and uh, i have another question as well okay uh, so in the wallet we saw how to like transfer algos so how would the wallet work when we're transferring assets it's it's like, just uh, an implementation it's... okay maybe okay. if i go over the code that i have used so for the transaction i'm using the from the to the amount um this might not be the perfect example because i've used the entire logic on the single on a single application but if you are using an api or you are using on the same application your your logic will be the same so uh, when minting an asset or when creating an asset you'll probably have different uh, parameters that you are going to use so uh, maybe let's go heuristic uh, so. I think yes. Okay, so uh, when you're create, when you're going to create an asset, you will first connect to your account to the testnet. Then, after getting the parameters, uh, you are going to use this specific method on the algo SDK. So on your client or on the algo SDK that you imported, you'll be able to use this specific method. And then you are going to specify the same parameter that we've used uh, on yesterday session. So there is going to be the phone property, the asset name, the unit name, the total. If the if you are going to uh, mint an NFT, it's going the total is going to be one. If it's not, or if it's a fungible token, uh, it can be more than one in the decimal, the note, and the suggest parameter. So everything is going to be the same, and it will you use the same logic that we've used yesterday. The only difference is on the signature part, you are going to use algo signer to sign your transaction. After creating this specific object, you are going to encode the transaction, which is this object that that that's created then uh, you can use the algo signer object to sign your transaction and after your transaction has been signed uh, your account your assets will be uh, minted into the blockchain uh, maybe just to make it clear let me go over the steps so the first thing is to connect let me also send this link uh, so let me first, th th this is going to be the entire flow of the application that you might use when uh, minting in an asset. So you first connect to the blockchain, to the wallet, then setting up the SDK. So by setting up the SDK, uh, we, are install we are instantiating the algo client by using the uh, token in the server, then connecting to the testnet. So I have a couple of accounts that I can use. I can get the parameters. So some default parameters will be generated. Then I'm going to sign the asset configuration to sign. Uh, the first thing that's required is from which account do I need to sign? 
or do I need to create the asset? I'm just going to uh, choose one of the accounts. So the asset name might be uh, certificate, the unit name, certs unit, total units. Uh, let's just say that uh, 20, because it's not NFT, zero and hello world. And when I say sign, the algo signer will pop up and I can input my password. So it's been signed. This will return the transaction ID in the blob. So to send this transaction, this signed transaction to the blockchain, we are going to use the, uh, from the signed transaction, we are going to use the blob token. So we are sending on the transaction to the testnet. We are uh, using the blob uh, object, the blob key argument. So when referring the blob, we are using this specific value, then this should be able to uh, create an asset. Okay, so the asset has been created, or maybe I don't have enough. Yes, I don't have enough uh, algos. Let me use another account. Okay, maybe let me use this one. It's 37, I have enough account. Okay. Maybe this one. Or want. So uh, on the details section, you can see the uh, parameters. So the asset total is 20, the decimal is nil, the type, the from property, uh, the, the one that's going to mean the asset and all other uh, default parameters. So I will sign the transaction. I'm not sure if this is the new one. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm not sure why it's failing, but uh. so just a quick question. Uh, you can answer it while you're doing that. So the Okay. The main difference between creating a transaction and creating an NFT would be? So when creating an NFT, you are creating an asset. So asset creation and uh, asset creation for NFT and non-fungible tokens have similar parameters. The only difference is you are, you lose one for the total parameter. So uh, here, yeah, if you are, sorry going uh, to create an NFT. Okay. Yeah, I meant uh, between creating an asset or an NFT and between making transactions, sorry. Okay, so when you're making a transaction, you are basically transferring some algos from someone, from one address to another. But when creating an asset, you are uh, creating an asset and uh, pushing that asset to the blockchain, not the actual, it's, uh, most probably won't, it won't mean that you are pushing the actual asset, but the reference of that asset to the blockchain. When you are making a transaction, you are just sending an algo from one account to another. Yeah, okay, another quick question. Uh, so I, I thought uh, an account could have several wallets, but it's by it's other way around, right? A wallet can have multiple accounts. Yes. Yeah, so so it so it is a wallet can have multiple accounts, right? Not an account can yes. have multiple wallets. Okay. Uh, no, no, no. An account, an, a wallet can have multiple wallets. An account, a wallet can have multiple accounts. Okay, okay, thanks. I thought the other way around. Thank you. Uh. So, uh, so are we going to follow the, the same step to create an Yes, NFT? yes. Just you, creating. 
yes, I'm not sure why this is not working, but you are going to follow the same step that you are going to integrate that with the algo signer to be able to sign uh, your transaction. Okay. I've used the same step. So if I go to my React application, you can see that uh, I've just used the make payment transaction which suggests parameters from object. So uh, because I'm going to transfer some, some algos from one account, uh, I'm going to send some, some algos from one account to another. I'm using this method and specifying uh, the required parameters, the form, the sender one, the receiver, and the amount that I'm going to send. And finally, using algo signer, I'm signing the, the transaction. And finally, after the transaction has been signed, uh, after the transaction has been signed, I'm going to send the transaction to the blockchain. So each transaction needs to be committed to the blockchain, and to be committed to the blockchain or stored to the in the blockchain, it needs to be signed or verified. And we are pushing it to the test need. And finally, uh, we can uh, check if there is any pending transaction uh, information. We can use the same steps when minting an asset and opting in for an asset. You can uh, you, you can go over the drugs. Here you can find uh, how we can opt in uh, for a transaction. So it's also the same step. The only difference is that uh, Yes, you are going to use this method when opting in for an asset and the amount is going to be zero. So the form and the two are the same. The trainee's address or the trainee's public address is going to be used for the form and for the two uh, uh, parameter and the amount is going to be zero. This is really essential when opting in for an asset and the asset index, of course. So you'll get everything. So for payment transaction, for asset creation, and uh, for opting in for an asset, uh, it, it, this uh, Pure6 uh, implementation has guide for all of the required uh, methods, and you can follow along and uh, implement your logic. <clears throat> okay, so the asset index, is that the asset ID that the, that the yes. trainer has created? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, Andrinet. Hey, yeah, I I have a, a question. One question actually. So, uh, if we if we are using the sandbox now, in this case, we're not using the sandbox environment, right? So, uh, the wallet cannot access our sandbox environment. So, yeah. uh, it's like we do we should like use the test net instead of our like sandbox and use the pure what was it the, the pure state API. API. you can use yeah. the sandbox if you connect to the testnet directly from the sandbox because the signer the algo signer uh, is going to connect to the algo signer extension is going to connect to the mainnet and testnet only you can use the sandbox and install initial instantiate it with the testnet instead of the devnet you won't, you won't be able to connect to the algo signer extension when using the devnet so uh, my question is uh, when we use the sandbox uh, when we use the sandbox and we, when we when we using the testnet uh, i thought it it just going to just download uh, i mean replicate the testnet in our sandbox environment not like the deploy the actual uh, testnet the blockchain uh, that is like uh, uh, out there. So, like, how uh, how does uh, the extension or our wallet uh, could actually connect to the testnet? Uh, actually, when you start your sandbox with the testnet or uh, on the testnet uh, network of the Algorand blockchain, uh, there is going to be a catch up. So, on every transaction, it will try to catch up with the actual testnet. So that's why you. Mm -hmm most probably uh, get a lag when making some kind of transaction when using the sandbox. For a second, yeah, for a second yes. like that, that's why, yeah. Yes, okay, so I get it. I up that. Okay. Uh, definitely, now it makes sense. Yeah. So like we can't use, uh, if we were like to use uh, wallet connection or something like that, we can't use the dev uh, nets, we should use the test net. Rather, yes, right? we should use the test net. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Uh, any other question? Uh, another question? Oh, okay. Go sorry. Go <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other question is when we do our interim uh, submission, I mean, the GitHub link, uh, should we uh, make our project in a mono repo format and like submit one single uh, repository or like should we do like separately the front end and the back end and uh, send the GitHub link to that? Uh, okay, what I would recommend is to, uh, to use SM module on your repo. So, uh, you might have one parent repo and for your front end or your back end, you can use git some module and uh, you can add that to your main repository or your parent repository. But definitely don't use uh, a mono uh, repo structure for your entire back end and front end, uh, which you can, but I don't recommend that. It would add like complexity actually. Yeah. Yes, yes. So like, uh, should we just, uh, go in a, I mean, like do, do it in a, for example, like front end folder and back end folder and just get in it in the parent folder and just, uh, uh, yeah. But it will mix up our like commit between the uh, front end and the back end. So I, I didn't like that kind of. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, so when using, uh, okay, uh, let me not complicate the, what um okay just um, okay for those of you that aren't familiar with Skitsa module you just can use a single repo and you can create different <coughs> uh, directories or different folders one for the back end and one the, for the front end and you can use the same uh, you can use uh, you can track both of them using uh, the same git tracking for the back end and for the front end but I would recommend you to use git some module. So you might have another repository and you can add that one of the repository as a git some module to your parent repository and you'll only be you'll only be submitting a single repository. You won't uh, necessarily have to submit two repositories. You will only submit the parent repository, but the parent repository will contain your some modules, which might be the front end or the back end. Okay, uh, does that mean like we can uh, do like separately get in it uh, different projects and work on them like commit and everything like locally and uh, we can just uh, have a, a parent repository and add as a sub module to that repository is is that what you're saying? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Uh, did okay. you get my question? Uh, no, I didn't. So uh, you're saying when you mean by like uh, get some modules, uh, we can just uh, separately like uh, do uh, get in it in a different project. So like do our commits and everything and uh, create a one uh, parent repository and add those uh, uh, repositories like the separate the front end and the back end as yes. a sub module to the yes. parent repository is that what you're referring yes yes you will be tracking those separately you will be tracking your parent repository and the other repository separately so you won't mix up the different repositories you will track them separately oh i get it that makes sense thank you okay uh any other questions so, uh, the, the the technique will be like uh, it, it, uh, just uh, we uh, will uh, we will just after we just uh, do separately everything like we can have a, a directory that has like git in it the parent directory and just commit that to our parent directory uh, nothing like uh, uh, other thing like uh, that's all we have to do right yes yes you might have a different repo for maybe for your uh, for your front end or back end Sorry. So you might have a different repository maybe for your back end or front end. Uh, and after you have finished working uh, on that repository, you just can add it as your sub module. Or even after we have made change, you can update the, 
uh, you can update your parent directory so that it will include the changes that you have made on your sub module. <coughs> right. Antoinette? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I get it. I, I haven't raised my hand actually. Okay, okay. Johannes? Honest, you are on mute if you are speaking. Okay. Oh, sorry. So I am a little bit confused by Andrew's question. So are we now supposed to to work on a different repo and then uh, take this to uh, repos as a sub as a sub module to the main repo or just working okay. on one repository? Uh, not not to confuse you. Using some modules uh, is the recommended approach but uh, if you don't want to use that what you can do is you can create a different directory for the back end and for the front end and you can track them together you can initialize your git uh, for the back end and for the front end you will track them uh, together you won't have different you won't be tracking them separately you just can create different directories one for the front end and one for the back end and you will be tracking them together okay thank you but uh, if you have time, definitely try to check out or look into uh, Git some modules. All right, sure will do. Okay, that's all. Yeah, uh, so besides uh, making our first transaction, was creating an, as, an, as, an, an asset or an NFT uh, demonstrated on yesterday's tutorial, lights was out and I didn't attend almost a sort of the last part of the service okay. tutorial. Uh, besides what? Besides making transactions, because I was uh, there for the first, uh, I was there for some part, but light was out and I saw you showing us how to make transactions and stuff, but I didn't finish it. So, okay, yeah. Was there I think, creating uh, an asset? Yes. In, uh, included? Yes, we also uh, created an asset, but if you, even if you have missed that session, you just can go not to this one, yes, but to the pure state implementation, especially uh, because you are going to integrate it with the wallet. This will give you a clear instruction how you can connect with the algo signer when uh, creating an asset, opting in for an asset and transferring an asset from the admin to the trainee. So everything you need is in this uh, uh, link and you can uh, look, you can go to the create transaction. This is just uh, to create, yes, this is just to create an asset and for opting in, you will have a code example or a code sample for payment. If you are interested in uh, looking at how we can make a payment using the, by integrating it with the wallet, you can also go over that, but everything you need is already uh, on the pure stick documentation. So you can just copy paste this code section and uh, implement your logic. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, what is the utility of the created assets? Uh, I'm, I think that you already said it, but I would like to make it clear for me. Uh, okay, I, I'm sorry. What was what, what's your question? Uh, what is the utility of an asset? And yeah, what, what do you mean is, by utility? Why why are we creating an asset? That is okay. Uh, so let's say you are the admin of uh, some training organization, and when your train when your trainees finish your uh, your training program, you want to give them a certificate. Normally, without using the digital approach, you'd normally uh, give you'd normally print the certificate and give them uh, the certificate, the hard copy of the certificate, right? But when you want to implement that logic and when you want to transfer the certificate digitally, what you would do is you will create an asset because 
on the blockchain, assets are something that can be transferred from someone uh, to the receiver. It might be an NFT or a fungible token. So when it's NFT, it will be the total amount will be one. When it's not, uh, you can have uh, more than one for this total parameter, and you will be transferring that asset to to your trainees. If not, what would you transfer to your trainees besides assets? So one other thing that you can do is you can uh, uh, you can uh, play around with transactions. You can send some algos to someone or receive some. But to actually transfer a property, it it does it's not limited to certificates. Mostly, uh, assets are used specially for NFTs. You'll see that most NFTs are being sold for a price that that they aren't really worthy for uh, to be sold, and they are minted as an asset uh, when the NFTs are minted to the blockchain, and they are being transferred when they are sold. They are being transferred from the owner to the buyer. Okay, it's clear, thank you. Okay, so if there are 10 trainings, we're creating assets. Yes, yes, because we are uh, creating an NFT, we need to create uh, a unique uh, identifier for each training. So we'll be creating 10 NFTs, 10 assets. Now, Angelet? So if you were to uh, take the code implementation you did on the front end to the back end, all we have to do maybe is just to uh, do API call passing the amount of, uh, uh, for example, for the transaction, for your example, the yes. amount of yes. we want to transfer in the public address that we gave from the wallet. Yes, yes. So you'll just accept the maybe the sender's address, the receiver's address in the amount from the front end, and the back end will call the API implementation, the SDK, by using the SDK, it will call uh, the algorithm's API and return back to the front end to make uh, the signature. Yeah, it makes sense, thank you. Okay, uh, any more questions? Okay, so is everything clear? And uh, does everyone has a clear understanding on what uh, you guys have to submit for the interim submission, both for the GitHub and the report? Okay, then I hope uh, it's clear. Then we can end our session here. And please. Uh,